It was a calm, cool day back on January 21st, 1895. The steamer ship, the Chikora, and its crew of 23 left Milwaukee headed back home to West Michigan. Little did they know a violent storm was brewing over the lake. It was a storm that would sink the 209 foot ship and take all the lives on board. The Great Lakes have claimed between 8 and 10,000 ships and over 30,000 lives. I would say less than a quarter of those ships have been found and identified. Some will never be found because they were broken up in shallow water and covered by the shifting sands. Uh, some of the wrecks haven't been looked for because of technology too deep to dive. Tom Farnquist is the executive director of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society. He is an ex-school teacher who has turned his own passion for finding shipwrecks into a full-time career. There's no real annual figure of success. Sometimes you'll hear of four or five ships located on the Great Lakes in one summer. Sometimes there'll be six or seven. Sometimes there may be one or two, depending on the effort put into it. The first big steamer cargo ships began to cross the Great Lakes back in the early 1800s. To maximize revenue, shipping companies would often extend the season and keep ships out on the lakes even as dangerous weather approached. The longer the wind blows over the lake, distance-wise, the worse the waves are. The month of November was the deadliest according to the National Weather Service. That's a time when cold air masses are starting to come south out of Canada. They're, they're meeting warm air masses still from the south and very explosive type low pressure development can occur. Lack of forecasting technology made it almost impossible for ships to predict weather changes. While weather was the most common reason ships went down in the Great Lakes, it wasn't the only reason. Fire was really a threat. Where do you go when your ship catches on fire? You have to think about what these ships were made of. I mean, wood and paint and tar and uh, sails. The Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum in the Upper Peninsula houses a collection of shipwreck artifacts. Pretty special place. It's my favorite place in the world, I think. Been a lot of time out there on that lake. Farnquist says each shipwreck found tells its own story. It may be the horrific loss of life, the artifacts found, or just an ironic twist of fate. Uh, one ship in particular, the Myron, where the captain courageously ordered all of the crew into the lifeboats. They all perished. He chose to go down with the ship, and he was the only survivor. He was found floating on the pilot house many, many hours later by a passing freighter and saved his life after a terrible November storm. The most sought-after wreck on the Great Lakes involves the lore of sunken treasure. The Westmoreland is one that everybody would like to find because it's one of those so-called treasure ships. There's reported to be about $100,000 or suspected to be about $100,000 in gold aboard the vessel. Probably the most famous object ever recovered from a shipwreck in the Great Lakes to this day is the Edmund Fitzgerald Bell that we worked with the Canadian Navy to recover, the National Geographic Society and Sony Corporation and Phil Newton from Vancouver, British Columbia with a newt suit. It was really an international effort. The bell is on display at the museum along with many other artifacts. A ship's wheel, a life preserver, all underwater treasures preserved to tell their story. Calm, clear water and sandy beaches are what usually bring people to visit Lake Michigan. But what lies underneath that lake is what attracts shipwreck hunter and diver Chuck Larson. You get a theory about where the, you know, the shipwrecks are going to be found by thinking like one of the old captains. You know, you're, you're in a bad storm, what are you going to do? You're going to try to get into port. Larson and his shipwreck hunting team use old-fashioned detective work to seek out the possible location of wrecks. Uh, we go to libraries, we go to historic documents, we buy um, all of the books that we can find that have been written that are still in print. Um, libraries are certainly a great raw source. Old newspaper articles. Once Larson and his crew target a specific area to search, they head out on the lake. A very expensive piece of equipment, the side scan sonar is thrown over the side. Yeah, I got this side. The 
scanner is then dragged behind the boat and transmits the most detailed look at what lies at the bottom. Looks like the um, stern of the boat is broken up a little bit. Maybe some of the stern's laying off right here. So it's from that line to this line. These little packages weigh about 150 pounds. The next step is diving to check out the wreck firsthand. Larson and team member Todd White wear dive suits made to withstand the icy cold temperatures at the bottom of the lake. It's getting colder out. Turn the camera on. Yep. Get it recording. Yep. Lights on. Each diver takes an underwater video camera to record their find. Diving to depths of almost 400 feet, the descent alone takes almost a half an hour. Trying to identify the boat is the first priority. It would be neat if the names were still on them. You know, you go down, you photograph it, and is the name on it? No, the name has been worn off, sandblasted by years of being underwater with the currents and the sand shifting along with it. If no name is found, Larson and his team look for characteristics that would help identify the vessel. Sometimes the shape of the boat will give you a clue, the length, the width, um, the engines that are on the boat, the gauges. After just 15 minutes at the wreck site, it's another 30 to 45 minutes to slowly ascend to the surface. Swam over this huge anchor. And then after the uh, big anchor, I went down the bow. While the dive may be over for the day, the work on this shipwreck is just beginning. the bow, all signs of life that used to exist on this ship. The ship has rested in the depths of Lake Michigan for over a century until its recent discovery by shipwreck hunter Chuck Larson and his crew. It's like you're having your own little history book just open up in front of you. And this wreck is in such great shape that you can just swim down the length of the ship and just make discovery after discovery. Larson says the discovery doesn't stop with the ship. It's vibrant, it's moving, there's, there's life all over it. It's not just the, um, you know, the, uh, the history that's there, it's the sea life too. It's just every single second is a new discovery. Discoveries that Larson feels should be left where they lie. Basically, the current legislation states that anything that's of historical value that you find on the bottom is the property of the state of Michigan. So we take only pictures and leave only bubbles. Once a shipwreck is discovered, the next step is authenticating the find. Yeah, it definitely looks like there's some machinery here. Tom Farnquist is the executive director of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society and has dove many wrecks, including the Edmund Fitzgerald. There's nothing more exciting than getting on a shipwreck for the first time, one that's never been seen before. That is the ultimate thrill. There's no requirement to report findings of shipwrecks, but we try and work with the state of Michigan, or the state's archaeologist, who are certainly interested in, in finding out what you've discovered, because there, there really are treasures of uh, you know, moments in time that have been frozen. It's a really good record of our maritime past. While there is no law against not reporting your find, there is a law against taking any property from a shipwreck. If you do want to salvage something from a wreck, you have to get permission from the state of Michigan, permission that's tough to get. You have to have a salvage plan, you have to have a conservation plan, and you certainly have to have an exhibit plan where people have a chance to enjoy and learn from it like we do here in this museum. Ten percent is going to be 40 yards. So for now, Larson and his crew continue to hunt for more wrecks. There are a thousand more lying at the bottom of the Great Lakes, waiting for Larson and his crew to find them and tell their story. Just like